Hello, and welcome back. This is Colin Keeley here. And I'm Brent Sanders. And we are the co-founders of Avocado, an audio publishing platform. Uh, so one thing I've been doing a deep dive in recently is SBA loans. Uh, Brent, what do you know about SBA loans? I don't know much, honestly. I, I've been learning a bunch through you recently. I mean, it's I, you know, my only recent awareness of SBA loans has been in, you know, because of the pandemic, they had a PPP loan as well as the EIDL loan, which I think is a the disaster recovery loan essentially created due to the coronavirus pandemic. I, I was aware of, of those. I was aware of SBA loans before that, but I always thought it was, you know, it just seemed like something that wasn't exactly attainable or you know, just didn't ever seem like an option or something I've ever looked into. You know, my prior businesses have been largely bootstrapped and I don't know. It just always seemed like something that would be hard to get into. So there's a lot of work involved. Uh, so I got into it. I kind of got into this holding company model, which is uh, like adjacent to our kind of startup studio model. And then it's like a this is a whole mi micro private equity movement where you just buy these very small startups and kind of grow them and put in best practices. And I think this is probably the most uh, likely way to get very, very wealthy is just buying small businesses and compounding over time instead of like shooting for the fences over every business. And so the <laughs> SBA loan is a uh, SBA 7A loan is by the, it's a government guaranteed loan that lets you buy a business. And so it's up to 5 million right now. And it's, it sounds like it's going to change with these COVID you know, rules going up to 10 million. Hmm. And the, the terms are very uh, friendly. And uh, it's, so I've been looking at it for buying internet businesses, which seems uh, a lot harder and much less common than buying like a daycare or something. Cause if you buy a daycare, and you run it into the ground, they could always take back the building, they could take back the land, they have something to go after. But if you run a SaaS business into the ground, you know, there's kind of nothing left for them. So it's, <laughs> it's hard. Uh, but I, I, like in the process, I got pre approval, you know, as much as you can, and it's sending over basically every financial record you've ever created on everything. Wow, uh, is the first step. I like your 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 bar that you're setting. It's like running it into the ground. I, I appreciate that. That's a <laughs> The way to go. I mean, the have you heard of people financing internet businesses? Because to me, I would I would expect that maybe they're going to be a little more skeptical around the loans because of what they can get back out of it, right? It's like if you're buying machinery, you're buying you know some piece of real estate. Again, they can they can capture that back because um, when you say it's government guaranteed, that means it's no personal guarantee. It's not really on your personal fine, maybe it'll wreck your credit score or something along those lines, but you're not really going to have to file bankruptcy if for some reason the, the business went south. Uh, no, I had described that wrong. So it is, per, you have to personally guarantee it. And often they want some form of collateral as well. So like for me, they'd want some collateral against my stocks or something like that that I have Got in it. investments. Uh, so I meant it's government guaranteed as in the banks give out the loan. Uh, uh, and yes, then if- if they default, the government guarantees the loans up to some percent. That's pretty high. It's like approaching 90%. Whoa. Um, and so everyone says that they're open to doing internet businesses. So e-commerce, SaaS, but then it, as you actually like make progress with them, they almost always back out. Like they get spooked. So I contacted one of the few uh, banks that does, you know, finance SaaS businesses. And he basically said, it's impossible to do a, so I am looking at a business right now. It's roughly call it like a hundred K ARR. And I, I went to this, you know, SBA loan guy that I've been working with uh, who like pre-approved me for everything. And I was like, can I get financing for this? And he's like, actually, no one ever asked me for a business. That's too small. People <laughs> like every, every day ask me for like $3 million. Um, so <laughs> you're going in about it the right way, but it's, you know, he said he's never heard of an internet business being financed below 300,000 and he can't even really touch 400,000. Wow. Wow. So, I mean, do you just, is it a matter of, you know, asking for a loan and just making, so it's like, Hey, you're going to have a purchase price and then including, you know, future costs and in, in getting a loan that's let's say half a million dollars and, you know, you're going to buy a hundred thousand dollar business, let's say, and then, you know, bake in another 400,000 for operating capital for the next year or two or to, to build a team? Like, 
Can you can you do that with a loan like this? No, not for a 7A loan. Perhaps you could get an SBA loan to like improve business improvements. I only Got know it. that in like, I don't know, you have a farm and you want to build a shed or something. Like you could definitely do right. that. Uh, yeah. But for this, often, so you can't go up to the $5 million mark, it seems, with internet companies. Like he, I think he said he did one $3 million loan in the last year. And mm. so most of these, you can't like do 10 to one leverage like you hear about everyone talking about on Twitter, because those people are mm. buying like, I don't know, you know, rental companies or something. It's more like uh, you should be targeting the 400K to 600K acquisition range, like up to a million. And okay. he, he said even million is like fairly rare for him. So it's kind of <laughs> hard. Like these internet companies that are trying to sell, often you're looking at seller side financing for these that end up being like in this kind of purgatory of more than a few thousand dollars, but in like the couple hundred thousand dollar range. Right. And specifically, you're talking about, you know, businesses that, I mean, because if you think about it, these are, are, if it's an internet or SaaS based business, you're specifically not necessarily like an e-commerce business. It's something where, you know, it's a tech company that is stuck, right? I'm just trying to think of the profiles that fit into this. It's like, maybe it was started by some founders and it lost steam or it's, you know, on a downswing or extended downswing and they just kind of want to, you know, offload it. Like, I guess in looking at sourcing these deals, like how would you, how would you think about sourcing a deal like this? So there's a lot of marketplaces. Most of them are crap. A couple of them are okay. And then going through like old product hunt things, basically like the typical person you're looking for is a developer, like a developer product led company that's gotten some traction, but doesn't really have marketing chops or they don't often they'll get to like the call it hundred K a little over that range. And they don't have the ability to start hiring people or like, cause you, at that point, you're going to cut your you know personal take home in half or more as soon as you start hiring someone there and they don't have experience, like putting the processes in place for growth or they have multiple projects. And this is like the one that they are the least excited about. And so they just move on to something else. Interesting. I guess the one thing that strikes me with, with this type of deal, right? It's like you come in, you're obviously going to try to do some form of turnaround, which is a, it's a whole category, right? It's all private equity is, is around this idea of, Hey, we're going to come in, we're going to turn this business around and, you know, 10 exit or whatever it is, you know, the goal or, or maybe verticalize it with some other related business within your portfolio. But in, in this case, like day one, you close the business, you get the loan, like your problems are now the same as this other person's problem. So as you think about like, you, you can't really lend or you can't get a loan for things like growth or improvement. It's like just for the assets of the business. So in this case, a tech stack, and then, you know, month one, your hosting bills do, and you're all, you know, all the same problems that this person had. So ideally, you know, it's, it's something that you are going to be able to, you know, compliment, right? And so if it was a product led founder, developer, it's something usually it's the case, right? That they're not like good at marketing or they're not good at sales. And you come in and you basically implement the basic block and tackle um, of, you know, operations and sales and marketing, right? Yeah, that's exactly it. So it's so hard to take from th something from zero to one, but once it has some product market fit, like there's a pretty established playbook to grow a SaaS business. And so you're just really putting in the best practices. Like you got to get mm -hmm. up to speed in the market and everything. And I would say the business that we're looking at is a bit more of a turnaround, but generally they're not really turnaround stories. They're just like, they're slowly compounding stories. And mm. you could probably compound a lot faster if you knew, you know, marketing, if you had a marketing skill set. So the best business to buy is often those that they just really haven't touched marketing or sales. And you just have mm -hmm. to put that stuff in place. You know, uh, like Andrew Wilkinson, who we talk about all the time, is a bit of, of an idol of buying. And he's probably <laughs> one of the like laziest, wealthiest people in the world. Not maybe that's not fair that he's actually lazy, but he doesn't have to do that much work. And he is, you know, around a billionaire now, or at least we'll cross the billionaire mark very soon. Oh God. Yeah. I mean, lazy is a compliment. I mean, from a software engineering perspective, especially like laziness inspires a lot of um, good things, right? It's like automation. And, you know, if you, you like to fill out forms, you like to spend your time doing, you know, semi-meaningful or meaningless things. Yeah, laziness is a good attribute. I wouldn't I wouldn't discount that as as an insult or as a, a negative 
uh, connotation. Or it's like every decision of his has just so much leverage. Like he, he all he has to do is improve things, you know, ten percent a year, and if right. you do that, like you could become very, very wealthy. And these internet businesses grow much faster than ten percent a year, so it's like the best return you could you could be hoping for. Yeah, makes sense. So going back to the loan, uh, you get some sort of pre-approval where they're basically do a life lifetime background check on your finances, and you have this minimum, right? Which is this weird sweet spot for the businesses that you're specifically looking for. And then what do you think like the rest of the process is like? So once you identify a business, do you need to have some sort of letter of intent that you deliver to them or like what's next? Yeah. So I was asking this loan guy, you know, when do I contact you? And so basically contact as soon as possible, get pre-approval as much as you possibly can, and then loop them in basically right before you make an offer and that th so they you get the SBA loan based on you and based on the business so they do mm -hmm. have to do you know a relatively deep dive on you know the cash flow of the business you know are they going to be able to pay back this loan basically and then it sounds like you could probably get the money within like three weeks and potentially mm -hmm. faster and so sellers love it because it's effectively a cash transaction so it's not like seller side finance there's no earnouts or anything it's uh, you get the money up front. Yeah. I mean, going to like a, a global perspective, like other countries, I know other countries have these forms of stimulus. I'm, you know, spent a little bit of time in Korea and seeing how they work with their, you know, venture audience and trying to spur on more, uh, more homegrown businesses. And I know, you know, I've heard of the practices in China where if you wanted to start a, you want to start a business of any type and, um, you qualify, you can basically get orders from the government, you know, get you up and running. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it sounds a little bit like, Hey, you're going to get a free loan, but it's not free. Right. And as opposed to I think a lot of places, I mean, obviously there are strings attached in every country and every, everybody has different models around this, but in the U S you're going to get this loan. Uh, ideally like the accessibility of the loan is the, the key feature. And the other key feature is that's backed by the government. So that the bank will actually do it with you. But then, what are the terms like? So is it, I mean, obviously if I say, is it competitive with the market? There really isn't even much of a market here. It's like, that's the first sort of killer feature is that you can actually get this loan, but the rates were, are they competitive with, I mean, something that if you were able to qualify in the private market or with a bank? Uh, so this will beat any private market loan. So it's a variable rate loan that's tied to the federal funds rate, which goes up and down, but right now is you know very, very low. And so it works out to be roughly 6% over a 10 year term. And you could pay it off early, but you basically never want to. And so the reason the government does this, it basically makes the market for selling businesses significantly bigger because you don't need all that upfront capital to buy you know, a few million dollar business. You could take out a loan yeah. from the government. And so it's good for the economy to have more people, like smart, hungry, young people take over these businesses and grow them. Uh, yeah. And then so it's, to me, I don't know if any other country doing this. I know they don't have it in Canada. And then the US is really sweetening the deal with COVID where as long as you buy a business in the next, before September and potentially a little earlier, they'll cover your first six months of payments up to $9,000 a month. It's, so the real danger with one of these acquisitions is a cash crunch in the early days. So mm. this would let you build a nice little buffer and call it the first like six months. So you could weather any you know storms that come. That's great. Would, would you ever, have you heard of, or would you ever consider doing some sort of combination where you get an SBA loan and then you also raise some form of like, um, you know, equity-based financing based on, Hey, I'm going to sell 5% of the 10% of the business in, you know, I've acquired it. And then within that first, you know, shortly after that transaction with the SBA, seeing if you can, you know, in thinking about like, Hey, you're going to raise the money to buy the business, but then you're also going to need capital to grow it. Or let's say you wanted to turn it around. You wanted to, you know, put $50,000 in Facebook ads. I don't know what it is. You know, it's just some, because again, I go, I go back to putting myself in, in the shoes of somebody who's going to do this. It's like day one, all your problems, that, all the problems that the seller had are now your problems. And you've just, you know, arranged this loan. You've essentially spent this money. Um, and now you have to, to make something work. And it seems like it would make the most sense to me to like give yourself the best chances for success is to 
have a little bit of a war chest or have, you know, sort of some bullets, so to speak, and be able to kind of use, use the resources to either, you know, whether it's write content, pay for performance marketing, or even bring in talent um, to do this turnaround. And it seems like that that's going to be necessary as well. Yeah. So there's a lot of different approaches to doing this. You could raise, you know, proper private equity funds. So you have this big pool of money that lets you go out and buy businesses or you do a deal by deal basis and maybe fill out 20% of the round or like a smaller amount. And you just have a newsletter of like high net worth individuals that you send deals to, or you, uh, so kind of a sexy thing that's come up over the last call it five, 10 years at the top business schools. So call it like Chicago booth or Harvard business school. They have this entrepreneurship through acquisition. So basically there are private equity firms that specialize in search funds. So they will give, these like top tier MBA students, a pool of money to go find a business and buy it. And it often ends up being like a a cardboard box business in Idaho. Like it's Mm. somewhat rarely an internet company. And then the returns on this are excellent because it's buying it from like a baby boomer kind of digitizing the business and, you know, off to the races you go. I I like the idea more so of buying something maybe five times smaller that you own near a hundred percent of and a hundred percent of the upside of more so than, you know, you are on the hook to these investors to deliver a return to a larger business. Sure. Yeah, makes sense. It's interesting. I mean, as you look at the private equity market is what I'm hearing. And again, I don't really work in it, but uh, as I understand it, it's super frothy. There's so much interest. There's so much capital and they're searching for, you know, they're hungry for businesses. They're hungry for deals. Uh, It's an interesting perspective to take to almost start at the bottom, which is you know, you're way under the radar, right? It's like you are, are so far off the, the, the size that the major firms are looking for. So I do think that there's, I think you had mentioned fork um, in this, this sort of like micro PE world where, you know, there's an interest in popping off like these companies where a developer started, it has a, a little bit of momentum, but it needs that again, basic block and tackle. It's super interesting. So is that, now the difference is, is like who runs it, right? So like that's where you look at the the tiny model, and you bring in and have a CEO that is well incentivized but doesn't get equity, right? There's some strong incentive structure to make them grow the business, and you know they essentially run it in your hands off, and you have nothing to do. You're lazy, like Andrew Wilkinson. Is is that how you're thinking about, it? or do you look at this as like something that you want to spend your time on, and ideally you operationalize in a way that it's not taking 100 percent of your time, but it's like someone still needs to be sort of the, the person at the, at the wheel. Uh, so I think as we are looking at it, so private equity comes in, I want to say when it's like a million ARR and up. So as soon mm-hmm. as you hit that, it gets really competitive and potentially, you know, you could build business to that point and then flip it to them. But so you really want to get in, in the early days. Uh, so these tiny like product on projects that make, you know, a few thousand ARR or a few thousand MRR or these ones, I think fork is probably the, best analogy to, you know, what I'm thinking of pursuing where they hit this hundred ish ARR mark. And what they do is they have a, basically an agency. And so they'll pay their agency people to go basically full-time on this business really hard for like a month and, you know, uh, upfront all the costs and put all the marketing in place and then slow, grow it slowly. And then they have basically part-time operators on it. And that's Mm -hmm. it. And they return to it kind of as needed on projects and they pay out to their agency as needed for the business. And it doesn't seem like they ever get to the point where they hire someone full-time to run the company. But I think that's kind of where the magic is, where you step in, call it 100K ARR, you know, grow it to maybe 300K ARR, and that gives you room to hire someone full-time. And then Mm -hmm. if you incentivize them properly, they run and like they would do better than you ever would. And then you move to the next one. So almost like a... A tiger team. That's what Google called it. When you have a tiger team, you hop (laughs) in, you like fix it all up and then you step away and put someone in place to run it, move to the next one. Makes sense. Yeah. I think it's a really interesting model. I look forward to to seeing how it progresses. I mean, I I'm really curious to see how the finance, like how does the SBA look at diligence? How do they, you know, again, looking at a SaaS business, something that's a little more rare for them, how they approach it and how cooperative they are. Yeah, you have to find the right bankers. So I maybe made this more confusing than it is. It's always the banks that are making the decision. And right. they're just backed right. by the government. Um, so you have to find, in bankers' view, the government gives like rules, but the rules are kind of fuzzy. 
And so banks interpret it differently. So you kind of have to find a banker that has worked with internet companies in the past and has a history of actually like getting them across the finish line. Because everyone says they want to work with it until you kind of actually, you know, want the money from them. <laughs> right, right. They're very friendly until it's like, okay, let's look at this. Uh, have you had any experience with some of the more tech enabled lenders out there? Like I, something that came across my desk recent was like Lendio dot com or some of these you know they're popping up and i think they're growing because they're taking on like ppp loans and all sorts of uh, different types of loans but these are like you know sort of the the lemonades of the lending world um tech enabled and i'm wondering if they're potentially more tech friendly or if they even do you know sba loans you're saying seven a seven a loans yeah it looks like lendio does i'm on their website right now it's like i'm curious if they are going to be more you know Friendly versus like you have a Chase account and you go to that banker. I wonder how, you know, the, the climate differs between banks. So I actually found the person I'm working with through a marketplace and asking for referrals to them. So uh, a marketplace that sells internet companies. So most of the companies on there are kind of junk, but they do know the people that actually do these deals and get them through the finish line. So reaching out through them and they connected me with an SBA, you know, internet loan guy. That was helpful. Yeah. We have a long history with Lendio. I was working with them for quite a while on finance fuel. We were going to be one of their lenders for invoice factoring. I think I absolutely swamped with PPP stuff and they kind of fell off the radar, but I think they're maybe picking their head ups finally. Great. Yeah. It seems like an interesting business. There's a lot of them. There's so many of these, you know, send a business to the right place to get financing and they seem to be all doing fairly well. So are they just a marketplace? Like they're just connecting people? Exactly. Yeah. That's great. That, that's interesting because I, I, my understanding is they will, like I was looking at them to do like a PPP loan potentially. And it was, you know, it seemed like they had nice tech to get all of your data in. And then they probably have a way that they rate you. And then they could probably shop you around to banks and whoever else wants to actually take the loan. It seems like a, a streamlined way to, to, from a consumer perspective to do it. I, brilliant idea though. So there, Lendio like- had a, a bit of a scandal where early in the PPP process, they were accepting everyone's applications and they got so swamped that they couldn't, you know, farm them out fast enough to banks. So everyone wow. was getting PPP money. And if you, as soon as you engage with one person, you couldn't engage with someone else. So they were locking up basically all these small businesses and preventing them from going somewhere else to get their money. I, I think wow. they eventually worked through the backlog, but it, they were getting horrible press for a number of months. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was it was a debacle. It was really a mess. And um, what I understand is, I mean, I remember, you know, looking into a loan and hearing about people just not, you know, getting strung along and then not getting clear answers. And the banks didn't seem like they were getting clear answers. It was just kind of a whole mess. But it does sound like everyone uh, that needed one should have gotten one based on, I think I remember reading something. It could be totally wrong that the money didn't even... At first, the money dried up and then they approved more. And then that there still is first round PPP funds available. But now there's the second draw. I know people are going after. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of people got money that shouldn't have. And there's some scams going on. But it's also good for a lot of businesses. Yeah, I think anything with the government, there's always going to be that element of fraud. But they, it's funny, you know, they don't necessarily get the money back, but they do usually, the inspector general is pretty good. They, they do find these people and even the ones that, you know, maybe too small to fly into the radar, uh, they do usually find these people. And while they don't get the money back and it doesn't go back into the coffers of the government, it's, uh, they do bust these people, I think. Yeah. Did you end up taking any PPP money for anything? Uh, yeah, for, for the first round, I ended up doing a PPP loan just so I have my LLC and the consulting company and um, did one for that. And I'm thinking about another round because I qualify. I definitely saw a pretty major hit in billings. You know, a lot of my clients turtled. They, um, and I have a really small client base. Like I'm really focusing more so on the entrepreneurship and working on avocado, working on um, new business ideas like formulated. And uh, with that, you know, just seeing like this, this in my mind, the, the next couple of years, I think we're going to see this as a really good time to be starting a business. That's my my main bet here. But in the meantime, uh, I, I am doing consulting. And yeah, we definitely saw more than a 25% uh, hit to to the bottom line. And a lot, pretty much every every single one of my clients also took PPP loans. Like it's a very 
Um, it was a very common thing and everyone was really stressed about it at first. Everyone was like, ah, we're not getting it. And all the big companies got it first. And there was a lot of misinformation out there was as to what was going on. I think Chase had an issue where, you know, these huge institutional, I shouldn't say institutional, but these very, very large companies were able to get millions of dollars. But, you know, the average mom and pop who does, they employ, you know, 15, 20 people uh, were not able to get it. But um, yeah, I, you know, self-employed and I've been paying myself uh, salary for a long time and have a long track record. So I was able to qualify. And so I did get the first round. I, I didn't realize, I think I could have asked for more, but I, I just did exactly what my, I think it's two and a half months payroll. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. I was able to qualify for that. And uh, I'm thinking about the, the round two, again, I qualify for it, but yeah, I mean, I guess I should, that's probably the way to, way to be. Uh, yeah. I like, think the right answer is to take it. So we got approved for finance fuel and we ended up turning it down, uh, which was kind of a mistake in hindsight because the company went under, but uh, yeah, it was unclear whether they were going to sting you or how you'd have to justify that you needed the money. Um, so a lot of people just turn it down rather than, rather than deal with everything. Yeah. Yeah. It's tricky. I mean, I also applied for an EIDL loan and took it and then paid it back. Cause it was like, I didn't, I didn't need it. And it wasn't exactly clear what was going on there, but we didn't really know what was going to happen. Like, it seemed like I was ready for my business to completely dry up, like the income side of things. And it kind of has <laughs> to be honest, but it's, it's partially intentional of like uh, reducing the amount of time spending on consulting projects. But um, and, you know, focusing on incubation that that's going to have a, a hit to anyone's bottom line who's starting a business. But um, yeah, I definitely, definitely thought about keeping the EIDL alone, but that one is not so generous that it has to be fully repaid. And it did, it was accumulating interest. So I, after a couple months and kind of getting a sense for, you know, you watch the market blowing up and doing great and you're like, okay, things are probably going to return. And with mortgage rates, what they were, I just said, Hey, you know, it probably just makes sense to repay this and not keep accumulating interest. Cause I don't think I'm going to touch it because you got to pay it back. Right. And so, you know, I, I just figured it was easier and, and simplistic, but it does look like uh, they're updating the rules around the PPP loan, mm-hmm. like the forgiveness rules and how that works. But it, it still, I've been advised by everybody to just wait, just hold on. Don't repay it just yet. Don't, uh, they may forgive it. They may not. The rules on how to forgive it and how they are doing it is, is still up for grabs. So, you know, it's probably best just to wait. Makes sense. Uh, anything else you want to cover? No, this has been interesting. I, I'm looking forward to kind of hearing how the 7A loan goes. If you, I mean, I think the first step is finding a company who's going to fit in this like Goldilocks zone. Yeah. It, so my thought is, actually the feedback from this SBA guy is the government is almost certainly going to run out of money for it because it's so you know friendly yeah. right now. So you really want to find a company in like the next 90 days and not wait until you know, <laughs> September 1st and hope that the money's still there. So I'm going to keep looking. Uh, it's hard to find a company in that exact zone. I found a company that's a little smaller, so it's a problem, but we'll see. It'll be fun. Awesome. Cool. Well, thanks for listening. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye.